Okay, welcome back. So let's look at some of these probability rules and, and some examples here demonstrating those. Okay, so let's start with our addition rule. All right, so say we, we've got a company and we've got their, their staff roster here organized into a kind of contingency table. All right, so say we want to randomly pick a person, what's the probability they are on salary or mail? All right, so whenever I'm doing any kind of probability problem, I'm looking through, I'm scanning for keywords. Okay, well, I see keyword here, I'm seeing an or, right? And I also need to think about the relationship between these events. So being on salary or being a male, are these mutually exclusive? Well, no. So I'm looking for a union. I'm going to be using the addition rule. They're not mutually exclusive, so I need to make sure I subtract that intersection. Now from a contingency table, we can really visualize this idea of double counting and subtracting the intersection because when I'm looking at everyone on salary, that's eight people. When I'm looking at all males, that's three. Okay, but we can really see how this intersection, if I count all salary people and all male people, I've counted that one male on salary twice. So I need to subtract that 1 13th for a total of 10 13th. All right, so I think contingency tables are a good way to visualize this, this double counting idea. Let's look at another one of our addition rule. Okay, so we, we're again, we're scanning through our problem. We see a key word here. Oh, I see an or, so I know I'm looking for a union. I'm thinking addition. I need to ask myself, are they mutually exclusive? Well, yes, these are mutually exclusive. You can't draw a card and it's both a four and a king. Okay, so let's call event four, getting a four. There's four fours in the deck out of 52. There's also four kings. Okay, so simply add those together. I don't need to worry about subtracting an intersection. I get two out of 13. All right, so it's pretty easy if they're mutually exclusive. Now let's just consider another example, right? There's four kings in the deck. We already know this, four out of 52. King or a heart, well, there's four suits, or 13 out of 52 or one-fourth hearts. But these are not mutually exclusive, right? There is an intersection there. There's one card. There's the king of hearts, right? So to find my answer there, would well, that be four plus 13? minus 1, we'd end up with 16 out of 52 chance there. Okay, so hopefully this can kind of help you see the difference between mutually exclusive and not. Okay, so now as we move into multiplication rule, let's just think about how we might find or think about finding a conditional probability. All right, so say I'm, I'm producing some, some parts here, I'm manufacturing some parts, there's 850 total, 50 of them are defective. Conditional probability would be something like this. The probability the second that we choose is defective given the first was defective. Okay, so here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for defective on the second draw given defective was the first. Right, well I had, so it would be easy if we just said what's the probability of drawing a defective, right? That would be 50 over 850. Right, that would be easy. So that's the probability of defective the first time around. Right, but I pulled one out of the pot that one also happened to be defective. So in order to find a conditional probability, I need to update what I know has already happened, take one off my numerator and denominator, that would be my conditional probability that I'm looking for here. Let's apply these conditional probabilities to our multiplication rule. All right, we've got cards again, and we're gonna say, now, now note here, we've got this keyword without replacement. We know without replacement has implications on independence. Right? That tells me what I draw first is going to have an effect on what I draw second. So these are, are dependent events. So here's what I want to know. Probability of drawing an ace and then a king. So this is about a sequence of events. Right? Sequence of events are usually intersections, even if it doesn't say and. Right? But here we have an and. Right? So what am I looking for? Ace first and king second. Now notice with our multiplication rule, there, there were kind of two forms of that. A given B times B, and B given A times A. 
right? But usually when we're working with, with conditional probabilities, we want to make sure these conditionals line up chronologically, right? So saying, given I drew a king's second, what's the probability of ace first? That doesn't make as much sense chronologically. This, this way makes the most sense, okay? So the probability of an ace first, that's easy, 4 out of 52. But since I've got a conditional probability, knowing I got an ace first, how many kings does that leave in the deck? Well, it leaves four, but it only leaves 51 cards total. Okay, so slight difference there in our denominator that will, in this case, maybe not affect our answer a ton, but the less items you have, the more impact that conditional probability will actually have. Okay, let's try our multiplication rule again, but this time to events like tossing a coin and a die, right? Whatever I roll on a die over here is going to have no effect on what I flip on my coin and vice versa. Right? So are these independent? Yes. So call tails, event T, probability of one half. Call get the three, event three, that's probability of one sixth. So putting those together, T and three, we're just going to multiply the two together for a probability of 1 12th. All right, so again, we're seeing this theme. When things are independent, it makes stuff easy. When things are mutually exclusive, it makes stuff easy. Otherwise, a little more complicated because I have to deal with conditionals, subtracting intersections, stuff like that. All right, let's try extending our multiplication rule to multiple events. So we're going to look at what if I have, back to our our um, production situation, 850 parts, 50 are defective. Now say I'm choosing three parts and I want the probability of a sequence. So defective, defective, not defective. In other words, what's the probability it takes me three draws to get a part that's not defective? Okay, so how am I going to figure that out? Well, the first one's easy, right? There's 50, 850 parts total. 50 are defective, so 50 out of 850. That's easy. All right, then I got to figure out, okay, given I got defective on the first, what's the probability of defective on the second? We found that. All right, so we've, we found this probability before, we found this probability before. But now, since it's a sequence of three, I want my not defective the third time. Okay. There's only 848 left in my denominator, but there's 800 total non-defective. Multiply them together, I get my overall probability there. Now this isn't bad for just three parts, but what if I had said, what's the probability it takes me 10 parts or 100 parts to find a defective, right? That would be doable, but we definitely wouldn't want to do it. Or we wouldn't want to do it by hand anyways. Okay, so what if now we have multiple events, but we can assume they're independent? Okay, so in football, let's say a running back has a 1% chance of fumble, and we can assume each carry he gets is independent. If he gets the ball 15 times in the next game, what's the probability he does not fumble? All right, so we're going to combine some rules here, because what are some keywords we see? does not fumble, okay. Um, do we see an and, do we see an or? Well, no, not really, but this question is about a sequence of events. When we have a sequence of events, it's almost like there's an implied and there, okay. So we want to know he's going to get it 15 times, what's the probability he does not fumble. So notice before I go into this, right, I, I got to say I have the probability that he's going to fumble, What's the probability he does not fumble? All right, probability is not fumble. One minus the probability he fumbles. In other words, that's 0.99. All right, so 15 independent events, all with the same probability. So I ought to be able to just say, okay, the probability that he doesn't fumble the first time times the probability he doesn't fumble the second time, and so forth. Instead of writing that out 15 times, since they all had the same probability, we can just say 0.99 to the 15th, and there we go. 86% chance he doesn't fumble in the next game. And maybe you'll argue that's kind of oversimplified. We're not factoring in 
fatigue and stuff like that, but you get the picture. All right, so hope that helps you kind of pull together all these different rules. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.